It's lunchtime in any town USA, and the fast food chains are coming to life. Can I help you? Can I help you? Yes, America is on the go. These days, most of us get our food from a window. Now, quick and fast. Have a good day now. But 35 or 40 years ago, we really didn't have fast food. And chances are, if you went out to lunch, your dad probably took you to one of these old-fashioned diners. Nowadays, most of them have been torn down, dismantled, or covered in weeds. This is the story of the New England Diner, how they disappeared, and why they're making a comeback. Most people think diners were invented in the 1940s and 50s, but their history actually began more than 100 years ago in the towns of Providence, Rhode Island and Worcester, Mass. You see, diners started out as horse-drawn lunch carts. Eventually, the wagons were parked and the owners put in counters and stools. Even today, you can still find a few old diners that have their original wheels. You see, in this business, you never know when you might have to pick up and move. One trademark of the early diners was the open grill. Customers could come in, sit down, and watch their dinner being cooked. Historian Will Anderson says that's half the fun of it, and the main reason he hangs out at diners. It's cooked right here in front. You know, if Pete, the owner of this diner, uh, flips a hamburger onto the floor, you're going to see it, and he's not going to serve it to you. It's like prepared right before your eyes. Um, and also, there's a much wider range. If you walk into a McDonald's, you pretty much are, you know, they have a set menu, and that's, the, that's what you get. But in a diner, you can pretty much get the, the, the full gamut of anything. Over easy, cinnamon bagel with cream cheese. Diners started out catering to the late-night crowd, but soon found themselves open for breakfast, then lunch, until finally many of them were serving food 24 hours a day. In the days, these diners had a sort of men-only tough guy reputation. Now, to soften that image and attract more women customers, diners changed their names to things like the Miss Worcester, and introduce the more comfortable and more refined booth service. By the late 1940s, diners were flourishing. Hundreds of returning veterans took out GI loans and went into the roadside restaurant business. For many people, the diner became sort of a second home. Comfortable as an easy chair, as spirited as a family reunion. Diner buff Larry Coltrera says, when you go to a diner, it's like seeing an old friend, even if you've never been there before. There's always been a camaraderie yeah. uh, uh, of sorts at diners, in particular, that feeling of friendliness, where you can be sitting at a stool in a diner you've never been at before and start talking to somebody you've never even seen before. Um, it's sort of that type of feeling. You can get right in. And it was all over. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to find diners these days. They're often tucked away in strange nooks and crannies. The Chadwick Square is hidden behind some factories in Worcester, Mass. The A1 is up on iron stilts in Gardner, Maine. And Gillies is out in back of a parking garage in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And why such strange locations? Well, sometimes it's for the cheap rent. Sometimes it's because they've moved. And sometimes it's because development just popped up and closed them in. Diners also come in many shapes and sizes, ranging from the sleek Sterling Streamliner to the 12 stool Pollard to the classic Worcesters that were eventually transported all over the United States. Yes, each diner has its own style and its own personality. But there is a big difference between a real diner and a restaurant with a diner motif. Writer and historian Richard Again, Gutman is often called on to explain the difference. Strictly speaking, diners are prefabricated, so they're built in a factory and then shipped by truck or rail to their site. 
And uh, the image, the look of the diner, that long, low, sleek form, uh, railroad style, looks like a railroad car, but isn't. In terms of the food, it's home cooking, good value, inexpensive food, uh, good food at a fair price. Unfortunately, most of this diner lore and legend is lost on the people who own and work in these places. For them, above all else, diners mean long, hard work. It's difficult to wax nostalgic when bacon, eggs, and dishes are up around your ears. John George knows he's been in the diner business for 30 years. When we're not busy waiting on customers, we're cleaning, washing pie cases, or polishing the hoods up, and cleaning all over, washing tile all around, windows in and out. Oh yeah, we do all this work. Perhaps it was this non-stop work, or perhaps America just passed them by. Whatever the reason, by the early 60s, the popularity of diners was on the wane. And along with the milkman, the service station, and the 10-cent Coke, they began to just fade away. New England diners will return on Discovery Sunday. This portion of Discovery is sponsored in part by Qantas. By the late 1950s, diners were cruising right along with a nice combination of food, service, and atmosphere. But then the bottom dropped out. You see, that's when Americans discovered that they could do almost anything in the privacy of their own cars, even feed a family of four. It didn't matter what was on the menu or how it was served. It was a perfect marriage, fast food and the automobile. People were so mobile in the late 50s that they got so mobile to the fact that they didn't want to stop and come inside and eat anymore. And the McDonald's and Burger Kings and the early fast food restaurants were quicker, it seemed, than the original fast food restaurant, the diner. And people just had that thing in their mind that it was easier to stop. They didn't have to go inside and watch the kids, that type of thing. And I think that really did contribute to uh, the decline, especially up here in uh, New England. As the fast food expanded, the diners emptied out. Many of them fell apart and developed reputations as greasy spoons. Now, large corporations might have been able to wait out this new drive-through burger trend, but you see, most diners were mom-and-pop operations, and a lot of them just threw in the towel. The ones that survived did so by passing the business on from one generation to the next. Once again, historian Dick Gutman. Diners traditionally were family-owned businesses. This one here was run by, started by Fred Casey's grandfather. And if Fred Casey's father or Fred weren't interested in running the business, more often than not, maybe the land is more valuable than, than the diner itself, and it might get moved or it might get torn down. The consumers of the mid-60s were simply exercising their freedom of choice, but in doing so, they eliminated many of their options. So now we live in a world dominated by Burger King, McDonald's, fast chicken, chain pizza, and the ever-present interstate that bypassed small towns everywhere and left diners on the outskirts looking in. Writer Will Anderson thinks that's made American life just a little more boring. I don't know. People seem to be losing their sense of adventure. Um, they'll travel a thousand miles and stay at a Holiday Inn and then eat in an Arby's or a Roy Rogers or something. And they don't seem to want to try things that are slightly off the beaten path. And this is true in, in, in beer and soda and, and mass-produced foods. And I guess we've lost our sense of adventure, sad to say. I don't know. Now, up until recently, the future for diners looked pretty bleak. But then a strange thing happened. They got rediscovered. I guess everything comes back in style sooner or later. And now, all over the country, diners are being rescued, remodeled, and restored. Experts say the future in the restaurant business is an oncoming train.
Yes, diners are popping up everywhere, from the upscale Fog City in San Francisco to the new McDonald's outside of Nashville, complete with counters, stools, sausage, biscuits, and banana pudding. A McDiner, if you will. Historian Richard Gutman says that once again, America is trying to relive its past. Matthew? The people who are in their 40s now are trying to recapture some of that recent past that has changed so quickly. And that's why diners have been re that's one of the reasons why diners have been rediscovered. Many of them have disappeared or have been changed, and people want to bring them back and say, whoa, wait a minute, this was great. I want my kids to be able to have that kind of experience. And so that's reflecting part of this whole nostalgic look at the classic era of diners of the 40s and 50s. However, some critics are having second thoughts about this so-called renaissance. They say diners weren't meant to have wine lists, fancy food, and waiters named Justin and Jacques. I'm kind of opposed to that because it's taking something out of its roots, moving it, and, and, and making it into something else. On the other hand, what's the alternative? The alternative may be that the place goes out of business, it sits and slowly rots and rusts, and then, then it's, it's, it's no good. So if someone wants to buy it and, and, and alter it and make it into a fad theme or something, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's far better than, than the alternatives, I think. Scramble two only with sausage. Yes, there are new diners being built and old diners being restored. But more important, the existing diners are enjoying a renewed popularity. And it's not uncommon to find customers lined up right out the door. That's a lot of work, but dinerman Rick DeMoo says he ain't complaining. I think the reason it's coming back is because people are, it's like anything else, everything always repeats itself eventually. And I think that people are kind of getting uh, tired of just going in and, and, and just ordering one particular thing and you can't change it. You know, you have a hamburger and that's where you get it and like that's it. Um, I think th those, those places will always be there, but there's more room for people like, like us. The New England diner could also benefit from the sagging economy. To see if things continue the way they're going, the power breakfast and the three martini lunch could be a thing of the past. Restaurant experts say what this country needs is a good $3 beef stew. And guess what? Surprise, surprise. That's just what these diners are serving. Yes, folks, lunchtime has come full circle. New England diners will return on Discovery Sunday. Returns on Discovery Sunday. The day starts early when you're in the diner business. You may be in bed at 5.30 a.m., but these places are already hopping. Yes, it's breakfast time at the Miss Portland Diner. Built in 1947 by the Worcester Lunch Car Company, this place is a true classic. It's got a marble counter, mahogany booths, and waitresses that not only know the customers by name, but what they want to eat as well. Plain with you. For some reason, people get real hungry when they come to a diner. For example, here at the Miss Portland, on a good day, they go through 20 loaves of bread, 45 dozen eggs, and 100 pounds of potatoes. And that just gets them through lunch. Moving right along, how about grabbing some lunch at Casey's in Natick, Mass? This diner, another Worcester lunch car, was opened in 1925 by Fred Casey. Now his grandson Fred Jr. is running the place, and for good food and gossip, there's no place like Casey's. We'll send you a flowers when you drop you. Don't worry, there's more. Casey's is small, even by diner standards. It's only got 10 stools, and most of the time, it's standing room only. But no one seems to mind, because there's nothing like one of Casey's steamed hot dogs. And how many do they sell every day? It's anywhere between five and 600 a day. What? Five or 600 a day. <laughs> We're probably 250, 300 burgers a day. It's a lot of hustle, you know? We go, go, go. 
From 11.30 to 3, like you say, the lines are out here and the three of us just running, moving. Anything else you'd rather be doing? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> and finally, if it gets time for dinner and you're anywhere near Pawtucket, Rhode Island, you might want to check out the Modern Diner down on East Avenue. Here's one place that'll never have to worry about the bulldozer. You see, recently it was placed on the National Historic Register. The Modern Diner was built by the Sterling Streamliner Company back when everything in America was art deco, futuristic, and designed to give the illusion of motion. At a place like the Modern, you could go in, have dinner, and feel like you were taking a trip all at the same time. Owner Nick Demu. Kids that come in, the young kids think that it's a train because it does. It does similar. It does kind of give give the idea of a train. Um, I think it's great because. Uh, the uh, name is the Modern Diner, and even though it's over 40 years old, it's still fairly modern. Back in the 50s, a diner was just a place to get lunch. Now they're considered roadside treasures, a reminder of simpler times and the way things were. One of the people who's tapped into this roadside nostalgia is John Keith of Falmouth, Maine. In the past few years, he's restored and sold six of these old diners. He says his purpose is twofold. One, to make some money, and two, to help save part of Americana. My interest in diners, uh, I think, came from the fact that I had a lot of good experiences when I was growing up in diners, hanging out, um, going there when I was a kid with my family, that type of thing. And since then, as I've been restoring these things, I realize it's a good way to sort of pass that, uh, that environment on to another generation because if all these things are gone, nobody's going to get to sit on a stool on a Saturday morning with their father having bacon and eggs. And it's, it's that kind of uh, element of it is something that I enjoy. One of Keith's latest projects is the Riverview Diner, built in 1941 by the Old Mahoney Company. The Riverview used to be located in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. When it went out of business, Keith brought it to Maine on a flatbed. So far, the tough job has been removing all the tacky so-called improvements that went into the place over the years. Like a lot of diners, the owner over the years sort of wanted to update it and keep it modern. And a lot of times, there were people ashamed of the fact that it was actually a diner. They were trying to fool the public. Well, I think that's true over the years. You see a lot of diners that are totally covered up with fake brick fronts or pitched roofs to look like colonial buildings or Mediterranean-style buildings. And I don't know if people were embarrassed, but as diners lost popularity and bigger restaurants became more uh, stylish, people wanted to give it another image, so uh, they would just cover them up. Keith's also working on the old Seagull Diner. It used to be on Route 1 in Kittery, Maine, but when the interstate was built, traffic slowed down, customers went away, and the diner eventually closed down. Keith says he got to it just in time. The Seagull is a 1953 Worcester Diner. For years, it stood on the Maine New Hampshire border like a roadside oasis. It's empty now, but there are still ghost-like reminders left by the thousands of travelers who pass through its doors. Perhaps a family getting lunch on the way to Boston or a road-weary truck driver stopping for a cup of black coffee. The signs are everywhere. It's interesting to see these uh, wear marks on the counter. And as you can see, that's right where your elbows go. That's years and years of people sitting there having eggs bending down and uh, solving the problems of the world right exactly and if you can feel those it's totally worn smooth also another interesting thing on countertops if you put your hand under it you'll feel about 40 years worth of bubble gum under there <laughs> which i always leave because i think it's kind of a neat thing to have that kind of continuity Hopefully they'll appreciate this sticky tradition when the seagull gets to its new home in London. That's right, a British chap finally bought the place. Figured a New England diner might make a jolly good centerpiece for his new chain of cheeseburger pubs. There's no stopping them now. Diners are on the move.
Now, businessmen aren't the only ones working on old diners. Families are getting into this act as well. People like Richard and Joan Lloyd. They've both been in the restaurant business before, but they always wanted a diner. Now they're getting their chance. When people come in here, they're going to see, you know, a family operation and first-class operation and at reasonable prices. And hopefully they'll know us all by name and we'll know most of them rather than just a customer number. The Lloyd bought what used to be a worn-out old diner in Orange, Massachusetts, and the entire family is involved in its restoration. The place is getting new wood, windows, and some outside enamel paneling. It's a lot of work, but the Lloyds think it'll pay off. They say people are tired of fast food and ready for some good home cooking. People like to be made to feel comfortable when they're going into places. And the place is small. You do get to know people. You can make them feel comfortable because you want to feel at home when you go out to eat. You want to feel like mom's there cooking for you. And this, this is the type of place you can do it. You know, somebody can come in and say, oh, can you have this the next day? Okay, well, we'll cook this for you. Just like when you're at home saying to your mother, could we have this to eat? It's, it makes people feel at home and feel comfortable. After six months, thousands of dollars, and a mile of bureaucratic red tape, Lloyd's is finally open. Yes, another authentic New England diner has been saved from the scrap heap. Champagne for everyone. Hopefully this will be the last diner we open. Or It's kind of strange. We don't seem to appreciate anything in this country until it's on the endangered species list. Another 10 years of neglect, and we might have lost many of these New England diners forever. But fortunately, that's not going to happen. These places are making a comeback. Just think, now you won't have to tell your grandkids about diners. Now they'll be able to see them for themselves. Today, they're mostly decrepit shadows of their former selves. But not so many years ago, they were the in place to be on a Saturday night. Drive-in blues, next on Discovery Sunday. Then at 11 Eastern, Wings. Watching the Discovery Channel. A car is a car. It won't make you handsome or prettier or younger, and if it improves your standing with the neighbors, then you live among snobs. A car is steel, electronics, rubber, plastic, and glass. A machine. And in the end, may the best machine win. Subaru, what to drive. My friend Amanda used to wear those horrible, fake-looking color contact lenses. Ugh, I said to her. Then one day, she waltzes in with the most gorgeous, warm, soft, sparkly blue eyes ever. Now this is you, I said. Illusions color contact, she said. But real, I said. Illusions, she said. New illusions for even the darkest brown eyes in so many colors. Satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Really? The Discovery Channel is proud to present an unparalleled picture of whales and the threats they face in their environment. Now through phenomenal encounters never before captured on film, whale expert Dr. Roger Payne reveals the connection between the whale survival and our own. This is a film that will alarm and inspire you. It is one you will never forget. In the Company of Whales, premiering Sunday, April 5th, only on the Discovery Channel. Brought to you in part by Subaru. It's what to drive.